Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. haven't even announced yet, you make me think I've been elected. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, you have given me a welcome that is so heartwarming, it's something I will remember always. In addition, if I had no such reasons at all to be happy about the, the form of the greeting and the introductions and all here tonight, I could be grateful because every once in a while being introduced, I get self-conscious when they begin to introduce me and start mentioning the pictures that I've been in. <laughs> now, I don't mean that I'm ashamed of them, but everyone who's been around Hollywood for any length of time has been in some movies that the studio didn't want them good, it wanted them Thursday. <laughs> and I've had my share. But in the, in the old times, you usually could count on the passing years making you forget those pictures. Now you just stay up late enough at night in front of the TV set and they all come back to haunt us. <laughs> Sometimes I think it's like looking at a sun you never knew you had. <laughs> that takes a second, doesn't it? I have a friend in the business who stays up late to look at his old movies just to watch his hairline recede. But you know, I've been protesting the growth of government for a number of years. I've had a concern lest the permanent structure of government become so big that it would become beyond the control of Congress and beyond the will of the people. And I have believed that this is a problem that crosses party lines. I've seen an interesting development down through the years. When I first suggested the danger of government control inherent in so many federal handouts, there were people who denied vehemently that every, any such thing could ever take place. And yet, before too long, the same people were saying, what's wrong with government control? And in the recent days, we've heard representatives in the higher echelons of government ask us, well, are you afraid of your own government? Well, to tell you the truth, I am. And all of us should be. And I speak not in a partisan sense of an administration or individuals. I'm talking of the institution of government. Wasn't this the admonition of the founding fathers that government tends to grow, to take on power until freedom eventually is lost? The fact is, and we can't escape it, only government is capable of tyranny. Now, I realize this is a controversial subject, particularly as we approach an election year. But then if you didn't take up things that were controversial, you'd never talk at all. There was a man knocked on a door one day and a small boy answered and the man said, son, is your father home? And the boy said, no. He said, is your mother home? And the boy said, no. And finally he said, well, son, I'm your uncle on your father's side. And the kid said, well, I guess you can come in, but I'll tell you right now, you're on the wrong side. <laughs> In 1772, the Boston Committee of Correspondence proclaimed the right to life, liberty, and property. Two years later, in Philadelphia, the First Continental Congress declared that Americans were entitled to life, liberty, and property. In June of 1776, the Virginia Bill of Rights asserted that all men were equally free and independent with a means of possessing and the right to possess and acquire property. And three weeks later came the Declaration of Independence, a bloody war, victory, and then a new nation which would be based on a constitution and a bill of rights. Life, lib and liberty, and property had become life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And 70 years would go by before England's Lord Acton would comment on the task of these men and what they had accomplished with this document. He would say they had solved two problems which had heretofore baffled the most enlightened nations. 
they had prodigiously increased the power of the national government and had founded it on the principle of equality without surrendering the security for freedom and property. And it's true. Our Constitution is a contract guaranteeing the most limited and equitable government in the long history of man's relation to man. Now, however, while the national power is prodigious, what has happened to security for freedom and our right to the ownership of the fruit of our toil? The French philosopher Alexis de Tocqueville, a hundred years ago, said the end of freedom comes when the party in power learns it can perpetuate itself through taxation. Well, what does happen to freedom when the executive branch of government can use the money taken from the people in order to coerce the people? A foolish fear? Representative Glenn Andrews introduced an amendment to the poverty program on the floor of Congress. It is almost inconceivable that such an amendment would be required. It is even more inconceivable that the amendment was overwhelmingly repudiated and defeated. It was a simple amendment that would prohibit poverty funds from being used for political purposes. Make no mistake about it. The party in power has legislated into existence a $1,800,000,000 campaign fund for 1966. Five years ago, we reached a new frontier. And now we're face to face with a great society. And along the way, we've added $31 billion to our debt, but we've decreased our gold holdings until concern is felt for the solvency of our currency. And very shortly, the coins we jingle in our pocket will no longer have the ring of silver. But have no fear. We reached something of the height of absurdity when in a press conference recently, we were told that the government would stand behind those artificial coins and was prepared to exchange them any time for paper. <laughs> We've discovered that every family of an, with an income of less than $3,000 a year is poverty stricken. At the same time, we learn that the cost of government prorates out to $3,300 per family. We reach an all-time high in food prices, as every housewife here knows. But the farmer who produces that food receives the lowest percentage of the market basket dollar he's ever received in history. And his debt in relation to income is at an all-time high, higher even than on the eve of the 1929 crash. Four and a half years ago, five years ago, there were no daily casualty lists. No wives and mothers receiving telegrams that began, we regret to inform you. The last campaign found our opponents presenting themselves as conservatives in the sense that they would make no drastic change in our easy, prosperous, and affluent way. They would maintain the status quo. That's Latin for the mess we're in. <laughs> we, on the other hand, were presented as radicals who'd bring about some cataclysmic upheaval. Well, now the wraps are off the great society, and a multitude of messages and legislation has made it plain we're to have the welfare state with an unprecedented federalization of American life. June 30th last, Congress raised the debt limit for the seventh time in five years, but our government spends $260 million a day, $10 million more each day than we were spending just a year ago. We're told that we're enjoying an unprecedented prosperity, but 42 government agencies, the government has just informed us, are spending $70 billion a year on public welfare. And serious discussion is given by men in high place in government to the idea that there is no longer any necessity to connect work with income, and that a man simply by being born should be assured of an annual income with no need to work. The ancient Hebrew book, the Talmud, tells us that for a father to fail to teach his son to earn a living is the same as teaching him to steal, for that might be the inevitable result. Our 
limited government with its decentralized powers has given way to planners, and they've laid an increasingly heavy hand on, heavy hand on every facet of our lives. To quote de Tocqueville again, he warned that such a government would cover the face of society with a network of small, complicated rules, minute and uniform. And thus the will of man is not shattered, but softened and guided until the nation is reduced to a flock of timid and industrious animals of which government is the shepherd. Well, the shepherd, the president, is fond of quoting in these days from the scriptures. His favorite seems to be 1st Isaiah, the 18th verse. Come, let us reason together. Now that has a sort of a warm and cozy sound, doesn't it? But let your eyes stray down a line or two into the next verses, the lines that are not quoted aloud. If ye refuse, ye shall be devoured with the sword. <laughs> Freedom. Freedom is very fragile. We've only known a few moments of it in all man's history. And most of those moments have taken place here, in this land, under this constitutional system and under our economic system of free enterprise. But freedom is also indivisible. It isn't spelled with an S. You can't elect to be partly free and partly slave. You are free or you're not free. If we ever decide we need a new declaration of independence, I hope we'll keep one line from the old. He has sent hither swarms of officers to harass our people and eat out their substance. Today, for every 10,000 of us, it only takes 12 doctors to keep us well and healthy. It only takes 40 mechanics and oil station attendants for every 10,000 of us to keep our automobiles running. 37 telephone employees to keep the vast network of telephones running in this country. But it takes 130 federal employees for every 10,000 to administer the affairs of state. <laughs> federal employees outnumber state employees in 30 of the 50 states. I don't know about yours, but that's true of California. And in California, that isn't easy. <laughs> the businessman, harassed and eaten out of our substance, the businessman spends 35% of his time filling out government forms and regulations. It has been estimated... <laughs> it has been estimated that this government paperwork costs American industry $20 billion a year, which must be added into the price tag. And it costs another $7 billion a year just to handle government's end of that paperwork and to store it, and already it requires 25 million cubic, million cubic feet. Some time back, to show you how this can happen, there was a little New England town that decided to get in on the surplus food idea. Now, this is a good idea. No one can quarrel with the fact that if we can raise a surplus rather than waste it, it should be distributed to those people who have need. So this little town got in on this and got its share of free federal surplus food. And then they woke up one day and discovered that they were being flooded under a great load of paperwork demanded in connection with this handout. And they discovered finally they put on so many new city employees just to handle this that it was cheaper to get out of the program and buy the groceries retail at the corner market. <laughs> now we've declared war on poverty. Now no one again quarrels with the humanitarian aim. I don't think any one of us want to be like the fellow that heard about the war on poverty and went right out and threw a hand grenade at a beggar. <laughs> but in getting the program passed, we heard a great deal about one state, West Virginia. Oh, this became a household word. This was the very center of poverty and distress and unemployment. Some of us thought that the whole war would be fought right there in West Virginia. Now the program is adopted. West Virginia gets $400,000. Texas gets $10 million. We're winning the war, though, at least on one front. 
on their own bureaucratic home grounds. $19,000 a year is a good salary, and it's a very high rate of pay in government salaries. As a matter of fact, there's only one employee out of 1,000 in the Department of Defense gets $19,000 a year. Only one out of 500 in the Department of Agriculture. But in the new poverty program, there's one out of 19. Gum Springs, Virginia was awarded $74,000, $54,000 for administrators' salaries, $20,000 for the poor. <laughs> well, While one voice in government tells us that we're enjoying this great prosperity, another voice tells us that one out of five in our country is suffering from poverty and destitution. Now, if that figure's true, it shouldn't be too hard to find the people who need the help under this program. Well, in my hometown of Dixon, Illinois, a committee of 10, self-appointed, beholden to no voters, has established itself and asked the government for a $38,000 grant so they can go on a search to find out if there's any poverty there. <laughs> it breaks down, it breaks down to $10,200 for the chairman and $7,200 each for two assistants and the balance will go for secretaries, mailing, office expense and travel. In another area, more than 2,000 college graduates have been hired as a part of the program to study the culture of poverty. Now no one disagrees with the youth portion of that program. The idea that we should salvage, if possible, those young people who, for whatever reason, have failed to fit themselves for the responsibilities of adult life. But we take over a hotel, and we install their young ladies who have been lifted from destitute families, and now they're to be trained so they'll be self-reliant and can go out on their own and make a living. But while they're being retrained, they're given maid service so they won't have to make their own beds. And the program prorates out to $7,000 a year for each young lady we're going to help. There are a lot of families in this country raising fine, productive citizens on less than $7,000 a year. I can think of no higher, more noble purpose than to take young men and to make sure that they get an equal chance in the start in life. But we have such a program now, and we put the young men in camps for retraining, and we pay them a higher rate of pay than we give the young man who puts on a uniform and goes out to defend his country. I am sure that all of us are agreed, every responsible citizen is agreed, that we should provide shelter for those people who, through no fault of their own, lack adequate housing. And for some time, the government has provided public housing. But now those who administer the program have expressed concern after almost three decades of it. Concern because an entire generation has grown up, raising children, and a second and a third generation now are growing up taking it for granted that this is an acceptable way of life. And there is no incentive for them to improve themselves because to get a raise might destroy their eligibility for continuing to live on a subsidy in the public housing. And yet, never does government accept that it might be responsible with some of its programs for this trend or this tendency. No. Now we're going to have a program subsidizing rents. And under the technicalities of the program, people with incomes up to eleven or $12,000 a year will be eligible to live in a house or apartment or a neighborhood beyond their means with their thrifty new neighbors taxed to help pay the differential in their rent. A variety of programs have diluted private property rights so that public interest is anything the planners decide it should be. For generations, we've had traditional laws of eminent domain. We have recognized the occasional need of government to take a citizen's property when there is a clear and present need for that particular piece of property in the public interest. But the citizen had his day in court, first to establish that the government paid a fair price, and second, that the government should be forced to prove that there was a clear and present need. Now, 
Urban renewal grants the government the right to force the sale of private property for resale by government to other private citizens who can then use that property to make profit. And we have averaged selling urban renewal pro properties to private citizens for 30% of the investment that we, the taxpayers, have in that property. Again, I say the purpose is noble. The idea of providing decent homes for every American and eliminating slums. But one million people have been displaced with a bulldozer and have wound up in new slums paying a higher rent. The law says the displaced must be offered standard housing at rents they can afford in convenient locations. But if standard housing at rents they could afford in convenient locations had been available, they wouldn't have needed an urban renewal program. They'd have moved there on their own. <laughs> Robert Weaver, the Federal Housing Commissioner, has said in the beginning he has made this statement public. The government gave the use of the land to the people to speed its development. Now, I didn't remember history that way. I thought we were here and on the land and we created the government. But he says... <laughs> but he has announced now, it is the policy of the government to seek to reclaim complete control of the use of the land. Planes equipped with surveying instruments fly over American farms. They survey from the air accurately to see whether the farmer has violated his planting allotment. And if he has, he's guilty as charged. No day in court. And he's fined. And if he can't pay the fine, the regulations prescribe the government can seize his farm and sell it at auction to enforce the payment of that fine. For 30 years, we've had a farm program. We've spent billions to make the farmer more prosperous and to remove unneeded surplus land from farm production to reduce the surplus. And during that same period, the national income has tripled, but the farmer's income is smaller than it was 30 years ago. And we've increased the number of acres in cultivation by 50 million. Every dollar that we spent on price stabilization in 1948, we are today spending $25. We've reduced the number of farmers by half, and the government says another two and a half million farmers are unneeded and must be retrained and moved to city jobs. Meanwhile, at the same time, the Appalachian program provides millions of dollars to reclaim marginal land so that the unemployed can be made farmers in that area and add to the present farm surplus. And an ominous question remains unanswered. Who will decide which citizens must leave the land? And how will the decision be made? How also will we explain that the same government that says that we need only one million large commercial farms now, that there is no need for the small family farmer, is still the government that tells us with another voice that no farm of over 160 acres can receive water from federal irrigation projects. Somehow one suspects that government in all of its involvement in the farm program will turn out to be something less than a jolly green giant. <laughs> Meanwhile, the network of rules grows more minute and muni more uniform, as de Tocqueville warned. Down on the Mason-Dixon line on a highway that is used by northerners taking vacations in the south, there's an oil station. Very enterprising fellow running it. A little triangle of ground, you know, between the sidewalk and the driveway that so often is covered with gravel or paved over. He planted a few cotton bushes there. Now when a tourist stops in from the north, he gives them, picks a cotton bowl off the bush right there in front of them and hands it to them as a souvenir of their trip to the south. He's just been fined by the federal government for planting cotton without an allotment. <laughs> the, the post office. Just recently, the post office was exposed as having for the last couple of years taken mail, letters addressed to citizens from the mail and turning them over to the Internal Revenue Service if those citizens were de behind or delinquent in the paying of their income tax. And now we learn that Washington is going to subsidize art and literature. The plan calls for two czars with millions of dollars which they will apportion on the basis of what they consider is meaningful in art and literature. Well, now, if they follow the pattern 
of some of the government-sponsored scientific research programs, there is reason for concern. Now, I'm not a scientist, but I sometimes have a suspicion that the government is subsidizing just plain intellectual curiosity when I see thousands of dollars spent on research in philology and faunal affinities of fossil bryozoa in the Middle Ordovician through Silurian. <laughs> now, the only thing I understand in that is that phrase, in the middle. There I know who they're talking about. <laughs> but nothing is too small for the government to overlook. The government in Washington is now concerned with our ability to enjoy ourselves in the great outdoors, recreational facilities. They've just issued a 134-page booklet on the subject. It's full of profundities. I wonder how we managed to get along without it up till now. For example, if you lay out a campsite, you should provide drinking fountains at such a height that the drinking level is convenient for the persons using the fountain. <laughs> but wait till you get Wait till you get to the exciting chapter on wildlife. Insects crawling into the ears of outdoorsmen sometimes create painful conditions. I got news for them. It's no fun when it happens indoors. But, wait a minute. That isn't all they have to say about wildlife. If your recreational area has a bathhouse intended for the use of both men and women, it should be divided into two parts by a tight partition. <laughs> now, now you know we'd have never thought of that one by ourselves. <laughs> Honestly, though, I know that they only mean to be helpful. <laughs> I know that it's really human nature and they're motivated by the most humanitarian of idealism. It's just natural for them to see the problems and see the immediate problem and to suggest, oh, if we had a little more money, a little more power, what we could do for the people. Now in an atmosphere of emergency and excessive zeal for our welfare, the federal government proposes to invade an area, the traditional province of the local community and state the finest public school system in all the world, with no real determination yet that the federal government is the best manager of our educational affairs. A suspicion prevails that they're not so much interested in speeding progress as they are in asserting authority in every conceivable aspect of the educational system. That an educational system that has worked very well and has been responsive to parental opinion. But Washington insists that it only wants to help solve the financial problems attended on our rapid growth. Well, problems there are, particularly because the federal government in recent years has dried up so many sources of, rev of local revenue by usurping those sources for its own tax policies. <laughs> but that same government has figures that reveal that we at the local level in the last decade have increased school revenue by 156%. We have built in 10 years $30 billion worth of classrooms. We have reduced the ratio of pupil to teacher and pupil to classroom. And we have increased the average teacher's salary by 65%. And yet every suggestion that we make for earmarking tax money and allowing it to remain at the local level without running it through those puzzle palaces on the Potomac first, is met with great resistance. Already there are 135 separate federal agencies and offices doling out money at the college level. Some time ago, a group of distinguished college presidents, alarmed at the extent to which academic freedom has been compromised by these vast money grants, went to Washington, and they had a proposal they'd worked out a proposal for allowing the individual citizen to compute his income tax and then deduct a specified amount and contribute it to the college of his choice instead of paying it in income tax. And the government, would, the government would be allowed to determine the proper amount that would solve the problem and yet not disrupt the government's own economy or need for revenue. 
And thus they would get around the, the question of church and state, the separation of same, if an individual citizen chose to contribute his money to a church-supported school. Over and over again in Washington, they kept asking, but why won't this system work? And finally, a Freudian slip occurred. Francis Keppel, United States Director of Education, blurted out, you don't understand, under the plan you propose, we couldn't achieve our social objectives. Social objectives. And now we uncover a memorandum, thanks to the press, actually, a memorandum in the Community Relations Service of the Poverty Program has nothing really to do with education, but the memorandum is very disturbing in this sentence. We should conduct a systematic effort to contact all publishers and school boards to encourage their publication and adoption of textbooks conforming to established standards. Well, if the government is going to build the schools and buy the books, issue scholarships, make judgments and exert pressure. What if one day that pressure is of a political nature not to our liking? Education is the bulwark of freedom, but you remove it too far from the community and the parents control and education becomes the tool of tyranny. Already here and there in our land, there are too many students that are studying from textbooks that devote a chapter to public welfare and not one line to Patrick Henry. Sometimes when you look at the problem, you think that government's like a baby. It's an elementary canal with an appetite at one end and no sense of responsibility at the other. We're taxed in our food and our drink and our shelter with the government taking a higher percentage from the productive free economy than any government has ever done in history without ruin. So-called tax reform, when it is suggested, winds up as the old shell game. They just rearrange it, shift it around and apply it someplace else as we discovered with the so-called tax cut we thought we had. Our tax policy today is based on the idea that we're robbing Peter to pay Paul. Well, we'd better take another look. We're robbing Paul to pay Paul, and we're all named Paul. Peter went bankrupt a long time ago. <laughs> Inflation, planned and deliberate over the last three decades, has reduced the value of our dollar to 35 and a half cents. Well, how did this come about? Well, but mainly because we have perverted our Constitution. Perverted it with regard to a welfare clause that doesn't exist. Perverted it with regard to the misuse of the taxation system. Perverted it with regard to the interpretation of the clauses on interstate commerce. And we've done it under such high sounding phrases as the greatest good for the greatest number, or one man, one vote. Forgetting that majority rule becomes mob rule unless there is a set of ground rules protecting the individual. One's right to life... <laughs> One's right to life, to liberty, to the freedom of worship, to speak, to assemble, in short, our God-given unalienable rights may not be submitted to a vote. The very purpose of the Bill of Rights was to forever put them beyond reach of majority rule. A hundred years ago, the problem of the nation was a nation half slave and half free and whether such a nation could survive. And today it's a world half slave and half free. And whether mankind himself can survive. We call out to the guard in the night and ask, does all go well? And echoing back from the shores of the Potomac comes the word, there's nothing to fear. Nothing to fear but an evil enemy who since World War II has increased the enslavement of eight per from 8% of the world's population to near 40%. Every lesson of history tells us that as a nation has grown in culture and refinement and advanced, it has softened, and when confronted by the barbarian, the less cultured, the barbarians have triumphed. You and I have come to our moment of truth. Does man exist only by permission of and for the sake of the, of the state, the group, marching toward eternity in a super ant heap, or does he control his own destiny? 
This is a question that must be answered by all of us, regardless of party. To those who are Democrats, ask yourselves if the leadership of your party still follows the precepts of Jefferson, Jackson, and Cleveland. Take the platform of 1932 on which Franklin Delano Roosevelt was elected. With its demand for a 25% reduction in the cost of the federal government, for restoration of constitutional limits on the power of that government, for a return to the states and the local communities and the individuals of the rights that had been taken from them. Ask which party would be most at home today with those promises. I know that the bond of party loyalty is very strong. I was a Democrat most of my life. I know it is hard to, to make a change from party loyalty and the party of your lifelong choice without a feeling that you're being treasonable or unfair. I say to you, have no feeling of disloyalty if you have decided you no longer can follow the leadership of that party tonight because the leadership of that party has long since abandoned you. And now to those of us of another party, to those who are Republicans, Today, the Republican Party is the vehicle we must use as the party of opposition. Opposition to the misguided leadership at home and opposition to all the evil abroad that threatens the dignity and freedom of man in every land. And it's an awesome responsibility. And you and I who are Republicans cannot meet it with a splintered party. For too long, we have been Republicans complete with descriptive adjectives and hyphens before the word Republican. Moderate Republicans, liberal Republicans, conservative Republicans, whatever label we chose, the truth is we've been sucker Republicans. <laughs> those adjectives and those hyphens were given to us by our opponents, and the time has come to bundle them up and give them back. If you have to hang on to the hyphen, just be a good or a Republican Republican. We can cringe in the shadow of a philosophy we detest but fear to challenge, or we can rise from a defeat and begin the second round of our struggle to restore the Republic. And now there are those among us, there are Republicans today who understandably, so hungry to get back to the position that we once held, to reestablish some equality in this two-party system, restore the imbalance we now have. Who has suggested, even somewhat cynically, that maybe we should start talking to voter blocks and making promises, that perhaps we should even reshape our party in the image of the victorious party on the basis that perhaps an imitation might get more votes than we've been attracting. Well, I'd like to suggest there is a block we can appeal to. It's a voter block of millions and millions of people. It crosses party lines, ethnic lines, religious and racial lines, economic lines. It's made up of millions of unsung heroes, people who get up in the morning, send their kids to school and go to work. They contribute to their church and their charity and their community. They believe that they were created in God's image and that God is the author of their rights and freedom. And they're disturbed because their children can no longer ask God's blessing in a schoolroom. I say to you, that block, that block of voters can be ours, not if we come to them with any imitation or ersatz program, but only if we're willing to stand on principle. Yes, let's be willing to tell them that we too want to solve and will solve as to the best of our ability the problems of poverty and hunger and health and old age and unemployment. But we believe we can do that without resulting to undue compulsion and fiscal irresponsibility that we believe we can put a floor beneath which no American will be asked to live in degradation, but at the same time, we will not erect a ceiling above which no citizen can fly without being penalized for his initiative and his effort. <laughs> and 
and let us tell them that hard though the problems may be that face us on the world scene, we will not buy our protection from the threat of the bomb by trading away the freedom of people in other lands not ours to give. <laughs> and, let's, and let's tell them that if their sons are going to be asked to fight and die for their country, at the same time, they'll be allowed to win. <laughs> to all Republicans today entrusted with this responsibility, because it is ours, I say look deep in your own hearts and ask yourselves if you possibly can have any difference with any other republic that is more important than this challenge that faces us tonight. If you have, if you're unwilling to meet this challenge, then you'd better start preparing, deciding what you'll tell your children it was that you found more important than freedom. They'll want to know. <laughs>